I say that because the glory of God does not come simply to make us shout or to move our emotions. Though we cry, though we uh, scream, though we, we may respond to the divine presence of God in our midst. But the glory isn't necessarily what we shout in. More so the glory is what we lay down in. The glory causes us to see ourselves in the light of who we are and who we are not. In the reflection of His majesty and His power and His awesomeness and the fact that the God of the universe has now subjected himself, if I can say it that way, has subjected himself to come in our midst and to walk amongst us. The glory of God inhibits and somewhat stops our human functionality. When the glory comes, it is not so much that we now have power to even stand in the glory of God. There were many instances in the Bible in which uh, men and women would encounter the presence of God or the glory of God and it would cause them to change their posture and their position, which suggests to us that when the glory of God comes, we don't just shout, but we change. When, 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 when the glory of God comes, we are transformed. We don't, uh, we cannot uh, come in and leave the same way that we came when we have truly entered into the glory of God. Everybody say change happens when we get in the glory. What, what is the glory? What is the glory? Simply put, as I stated before, the glory is simply the manifestation of the divine presence of the invisible God. It is His beauty. It is his attributes and actions. It, it is the feeling uh, not only that he is present, but as we've said before, because our God is omnipresent, meaning he is in all places at all times, still, yet and still, he does not reveal himself to be in all places at all times. And we must celebrate and appreciate the fact of when our worship is right and when our requests are right before God, that God comes in our midst and He makes Himself known. The reality is God is here whether individuals know it or not. Right, right. David said it. David said, if I take my bed and I go down into hell, God is there. Mm -hmm. If I take the wings of the morning and I fly to the uttermost parts of the earth, He said, God is there. Then He says, where? Can I flee from the presence of God? Some of us have tried to go to a tavern. Some of us have gone to the crack house. Some have gone, tried to run away from Jonah wasn't the only one. Right? Some of us have tried to pursue our own life's journey in an attempt to get away from what God wants in order to perform what we want. But David has already instructed us that there is no place that you can get away from the presence of God. Right. And while that is true, still we must admit that there are times in all of our lives in which it seems like God, who is everywhere, seems to be nowhere at the same time. Seems like I'm in my situation by myself. Seems like as I'm praying, God is not answering and He feels far from me. Maybe I'm the only one that's experienced that, but uh, there have been times in my life and in my walk with God that it seems as if I cried to the Lord but I could not perceive him. Job tells us this. Job says, I, I sought him on my right hand and, and he was not found there. And I looked on my left and he wasn't there. I, I went behind. I tried to retrace my steps and I went forward but I could not find the presence of God. It seemed as if God had gone on vacation. But want us to understand something that while uh, we are in pursuit, yes God, while we are in pursuit of God's presence, uh, may I suggest to us that God is in pursuit of our presence. Amen. Oh, thank you Lord. I said God is in pursuit Amen. of our presence. Not merely us showing up 
on Sunday morning and gathering in the sanctuary, but as God would come to Adam at the beginning of the book, in the cool of the day, in a romantic rendezvous of intimacy and prayer and communication and relationship, God went looking for Adam. I want you to help me this morning. I'm not going to be long, but elbow your neighbor and tell your neighbor, say to them, neighbor, neighbor. Adam wasn't the only one God was looking for. Tell them God's looking for you. God's looking for you in the morning when he nudges you in the spirit and tells you he wants to spend time with you. He's looking for you. God, God, God is looking for you. Unfortunately, sometimes when we're seeking to find something to entertain, our curiosity on TV, and there's nothing on TV. We got 250 channels and can't find nothing to watch. God's looking for you. Maybe God wants you to put, turn the TV off, put the remote down, pick up your Bible, and spend some time talking to Him. God is looking for you. And it seems that we're in a time in which some are awakening to this reality. And so now we hear a lot. We're hearing more and more about the glory. Suggest to us, even when we consider the Bible, there's something that we've heard called the law of first mention, which suggests to us that anytime something is first mentioned, uh, it sets a precedence, it sets a foundation of activities that can be expected from that time forward. And we know that our God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Though He is progressive, God is not changing, and that that that, that to scratch our head because he, he's not changing, but it seems that he's progressing. And it, it seems like uh, God is advancing and revealing things to us that have never been known. But Ecclesiastes tells us that what shall be has always been. In other words, because God is eternal, amen, the attributes and the things of God, amen, did not just come into existence, but God it was already there from the beginning of what we would call time. Out of eternity. Uh, but, but I want us to understand, amen, that uh, when we're looking at this law of first mention, we can go back to the book of Genesis. And the Bible declares that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. Uh, but I want us to understand and lift in our minds this morning to understand that if the glory of God, the presence of God is going to be realized and experienced, we've got to get some things in order. I want everybody to say, i got to get some stuff in order. Y'all didn't say it like you meant it. Don't say it just because I'm asking you to say it. But if you are truly in pursuit of the presence of God, if church as usual, which seems to be the cliche of our day, if church as usual no longer has the ability to satisfy your Sunday craving, but there's something more that you want from God, there's something more that you want to see from God, there's something more that we need to experience from God, because it is in the glory of God that deliverance can take place, it is in the glory of God that divine healing can take place, and I heard it said even on the other afternoon, amen, there is a new norm that is coming back to the church of God, no longer, amen, will the church reside in a place of apathy when it comes to the manifestation of the power of God, but there are some people that are sitting in this sanctuary right now that says, I believe God can do more than what I've seen him do over the last five years. I know that not, not only do I believe God can do more, I know God somebody that's hungry for him. God is looking for somebody that's no longer placating to the appetites of their flesh but there's a longing in their spirit that says I want to see more. I don't just want to see the blinded eyes open but I got some relatives amen that have some addictions that have strangled their life for years and, and I've been seeing about a power that I said can deliver and I'm tired of just talking about it. I realize it's going to something and I just, I'm just believing this morning there's somebody else in this sanctuary that said, Lord, if you're going to do it in this season, 
visitation of the sons and the daughters of God. The world is saying the church is supposed to be that light in a gross and a dark world. And it seems like the church has gone to sleep. No longer has power. The church now is satisfied with playing, amen, with the things within the four walls of the church. As long as we got a nice praise team and we got a pretty building, as long as my clothes are looking fly. Monday through Saturday. I don't want, I don't want that kind of an altar. 
said consecrate themselves three days. Some of y'all know where we're going right there. He said consecrate themselves three days. He said and watch their clothes. Because on the third day, I'm coming in the midst of my people. And brothers and sisters, can I suggest to us that when God says he's coming, it's time.
grave of a man that hadn't been there long, that a winning bones touched it, that life came back. There is a divine glory that brings resurrection to those that are dead in sin, those that have walked away from God. There's a glory that will cause them to come back to the house of God.
There are a lot of things that the church may never get. There's one thing that the church cannot become comfortable and not have. That is the manifested presence of God yes. in the yes. midst of his yes. people. Yes. Now I can understand God not showing up in the midst of heathen. Right. Yes. Of those that are not called by his name. Right. But, but it ought to be a problem. Yes. And, and the presence is here today. I'm, I'm, but it, it ought to be a problem. It, 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 it shouldn't be the exception. It should be the rule. Right. And, and, and what we got to do, pillars, foundations, we got to go back yes. and rebuild the old yes. waste place. Yes. They said, Pastor, ain't nobody coming to prayer. Well, all I need is about four or five pillars. Amen. They said, we ain't moving.
Everybody stand, please. That's, listen to me. That's, that's not just my prayer. That's my sacrifice. Do you hear me? Wanting to be in God's presence is not just my prayer. It's the motivation for my sacrifice. You're, you're not going to get it coming to this altar. Me laying my hands on you and that's all you got to do. God says there's some change that's got to happen. There's some changes that have, have to happen in our mind. The mind of Christ. There's some things that have to be transformed in our hearts. There's some things that have attached themselves to our spirit that, that you know are grieving the spirit of God in you. It's agitating the spirit of God. I know I'm talking right. There are some things that's attached themselves to your mind, to your heart, to your life, and they are grieving the spirit of God in you. But my flesh is so strong. God has said for three days, I want you to cleanse yourself. Now, I'm, I'm talking to everybody, but I have sense enough to know I'm not talking to everybody. But to everybody that has an ear, I'm not putting you on the penny fans. I'm not putting you on absolute. I'm not putting you on anything. I'm telling you for the next three days, you know what a viable sacrifice. If you got the Holy Ghost, which is the spirit of truth. Because for some of us, while we need to put the plate down, we need to put Facebook down too. That's the stuff that's messing with your spirit. I'm for real. So I'm not going to tell you what to put down, but I'm telling you God says cleanse yourself. That is, cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's what I'm telling you. For three days. If you will do that, as a man of God, as I have said what God has called me to say, if you will do that, God says, I'm going to show up in your life. You can take it however you want to take it. I'm just going to be obedient. He said, I'm going to show up. I'm going to manifest my glory. There can be no poverty in my glory. situation. Yeah. I don't know, Chris, you coming for your job. 